and welcome to the third meeting of the Health and Sport Committee of 2018. Uh, can I ask uh, everyone to make sure that their mobile phones are on silent and uh, also remind people that while it's perfectly acceptable to use mobile devices for social media, uh, please no recording and no photography uh, as we have people to do that for us in the Parliament. Um, received apologies today from Sandra White and we move first of all to agenda item one uh, which is subordinate legislation. As colleagues will know, we have two negative instruments to consider today. The first instrument is the National Health Service Pension Scheme Scotland Miscellaneous Amendments Number 2 regulations of 2017. There has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has made no comments on this instrument. Uh, and uh, I would therefore uh, intend uh, that we simply uh, agree no recommendations on that instrument. Is that the view of members, or do members have any comments they wish to offer on this instrument? If not, uh, thank you very much, and that is agreed. Uh, move on to the second instrument, which is the National Health Service Superannuation Scheme, Scotland Miscellaneous Amendments Number 2, Regulations of 2017. There has been no motion to annul this instrument either. However, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has made comments to Parliament on deficiency of drafting uh, of this instrument. So uh, can I invite any comments from members in relation to this instrument, uh, uh, which is before you? If not, uh, I would suggest that we write, we have time, the instrument does not, we require to respond or otherwise by the 5th of February, which gives us a little time. So I would suggest to members that we write to the government uh, and ask them how they intend to address the point that has been raised by the Delegated, law, uh, Delegated Persian Law Reform Committee. Is that agreeable to members? Agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, can we move on to the second item of the agenda and uh, uh, welcome our uh, several guests who have joined us for the round table and in the public gallery. Uh, I think uh, given we have uh, such a large collection of distinguished witnesses, it would probably be helpful if we went round the table uh, and asked people to introduce themselves simply by uh, name and uh, organisation as appropriate. This uh, is our uh, uh, second, uh, or as part of our series of round, ta round table sessions on the preventive agenda, and on this occasion, specifically dealing with sexual health, bloodborne vi viruses and HIV. I am Lewis MacDonald, I'm the convener of the committee, and I'll pass round to my Good morning, I'm Ash Denham, I'm the Deputy Convener. Uh, morning, I'm Dr Ken Oates, I'm a consultant in public health for NHS Highland and Inverness. Morning, I'm Miles Briggs, I'm Conservative MSP for Lothian and Conservative Spokesman for Health and Sport. Good morning, I'm George Valiotis, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of HIV Scotland. Good morning everyone, I'm Alex Cole-Hamilton, uh, Lib Dem MSP for Edinburgh Weston and my party's Health and Sport Spokesperson. I'm Professor John Dillon, I work for NHS Tayside and the University of Dundee. I'm Jenny Gorus, the constituency MSP for Mid Fife and Glenrothes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Emma Harper. I'm MSP for South Scotland Region. Good morning. I'm Emilia Crichton. I'm the Deputy Director of Public Health in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Alison Johnston, MSP for Lothian. David Goldberg, Health Protection Scotland. Hey, good morning. Ivan McKee, MSP for Glasgow Proven. Uh, Petra Wright, Scottish Officer of the Hepatitis C Trust. I'm Mildred Simonia, Senior Manager with Waverley Care. Good morning, I'm Brian Whittle, South of Scotland, MSP. I'm Duncan McCormick, a consultant in public health at NHS Lothian. I'm David Stewart, I'm an MSP for Highlands and Islands. Thank you very much. We'll move uh, directly to questions. Before I ask uh, Alex Cole Hamilton to kick us off, the, some of you will have taken part in roundtables at the Scottish Parliament before, some of you will not. Uh, essentially, we are looking to obtain as much uh, understanding and evidence and information as we can over the next hour and a half. That's best done by a structured discussion. Um, on, at the same time, I would want to encourage everyone who has something to contribute to a particular point to indicate to myself in the chair, and I will seek to uh, call you uh, in uh, on that particular question. Uh, so if I can ask Alex to ask the first question and then see an indication from uh, any of the witnesses who wish to provide the first answer. Alex. Uh, 
Thank you, convener. Good morning, everyone. I should start by declaring an interest that I'm the convener, co-convener of the cross-party group on uh, sexual health and bloodborne viruses. It's also been my privilege to have chaired the HIV Stigma Consortium. Uh, my question spans both HIV and Hep C in respect of the fact that uh, one of the biggest problems, barriers that we face in terms of the public health response to both is that identification uh, still proves very difficult. And I would like the reflections from the panel as the correlation between... Uh, rising levels of, well, resilient levels of stigma around both and the fact that that's acting as a barrier to people getting tested or seeking treatment or even admitting to themselves that they might have uh, one or other or both, indeed, of these infections. I, I'm aware that the World Health Organization has set as a target of, uh, in HIV in particular, of 90-90-90, which is 90% um, identified, 90% in treatment and 90% uh, non-detectable viral load. I, I may have got that wrong, um, but you get the gist. So if we can open up um, with the reflection on how stigma is still a barrier to people firstly being identified and then receiving treatment. I'm looking to John, oh, yep, uh, please. So stigma is an issue. Uh, I, I, my expertise is within hepatitis C rather than HIV, but the, the, some of the issues cross across both. Um, the stigma with hepatitis C is usually because of its strong association with drug use and the negative correlations that go with that. The <coughs> people who are affected by the virus are likely to be in environments where they are fearful of moving out of them because of the fear of stigma, etc. So while it, we can try and destigmatize the disease, that's going to be a long-term large issue. What we can do is make our, our services that are relevant to hepatitis C and to HIV embedded in the places where people are already comfortable going, rather than sending them to new environments and making them track across new barriers. So we need to adapt our services to, to, to facilitate people's access into care, rather than st st sitting in our traditional ivory towers and making people come to us. So that's one way around it. Clearly, it's not going to destigmatize it in the same way, but it's a way of working around that stigma problem, and clearly we need another agenda around destigmatizing the disease but that's the practical issue that we can do today for people who are desperately in need of treatment and I think that should be the, the focus of much of the effort because we are particularly with hepatitis C those people who are prepared to come out of the environments that they're in and come to hospital come to the traditional pathways of care have largely engaged with treatment and been treated but the bulk of people who are still engaged with addiction services or other um, for other for third sector providers etc where we could access these people um, are fearful of moving out of them and we need to make our services more adaptable and move into those areas thank you very much dr craig the Glasgow and Clyde, we carried out research in, with a view to carrying out a campaign to address the stigma, and that was particularly among our staff. So what we had was a huge poster, you could see from far, above, far away, you could, it, that it said the same as you. And you could see people being attracted until they came fairly close and they saw I'm HIV positive, and they were swerving away. So I think the message, the subtle message, is that we still have quite a lot to do with our own staff because particularly in relation to HIV, the long memories are still there. I was working with John's team nearly 20 years ago in, um, in Dundee when HIV was an incurable disease and people were dying. Since then, HIV is a long-term condition. People have... Uh, long, life, fulfilling lives, So, but the message has not permeated to everyone. So we still have a challenge in actually saying this is like anything else. You know, it's better to know, and if you, if you get treated, then, you know, you have a fulfilling life and you're no risk to anybody. So we do have a long journey to go. Uh, Petra, right. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to speak up for, oh, sorry, um, another group of people. I think the, the largest group amongst the undiagnosed are previous um, injecting drug users, uh, people who may have been infected for 30 years uh, or whatever. Um, not very much has been done to find them and I feel that because they're re recuperated, if you like, rehabilitated, they're all working um, and contributing to society. The stigma around hepatitis C uh, stops people from coming forward, even when they remember that they have had risk factors in the past. Um, you know, so normalising of testing um, instead of just 
continually targeting harm reduction services might have an impact on reducing stigma. For instance, uh, pregnant women get tested for HIV and hepatitis B, but not for hepatitis C. Um, and the number of people that I speak to who presume that they have been tested for hepatitis C before they've had their babies. So it's an opportunity missed. OK. Um, yes. I work for, for Waverly Care, and uh, one of the projects that we work with um, is called the Faith in Health Agenda. And in this agenda, what we are responding to is the particular issue that Professor John Dillon mentioned is about going to where people are and also understanding how people think and how people see the world around them. So part of what we do is we work with faith leaders and we work with faith communities, get the messages from them, how they would want to receive the messages in terms of HIV, understand where they are coming in terms of faith. And I think this work began quite early on around 2004 when we recognized that uh, for patients who were coming into clinic for treatment, a number of them were stopping their treatment and not adhering because of their faith. And you would understand that people see the doctor maybe for just five minutes and they are out of the door and for the next six months they are, they are relating to their faith leader. And we understood that um, from very on, very early on. And so part of what we are doing is actually working with the faith leader themselves to talk to their faith communities about HIV and um, not actually excluding the, the aspect that faith is actually an integral part of their lives. And so if a faith leader is standing up to say, let's challenge HIV together, people are more likely to listen to that. And um, I guess also for the NHS and staff working in the NHS, this is something that uh, we've continually been emphasizing around the fact that if someone says uh, they believe they've been healed, what is your response to that? And it should be a person-centered response. And so this is some of what we are, we are challenging. And when we look at uh, the funding that's out there besides Scottish government, which has been very supportive in, in terms of some of this work, we find that a lot of uh, religion-focused uh, work is excluded from funding. So there's a challenge out there to access this funding to do the work. Then again, in terms of NHS, when we look at volunteers, who are visible in the community, who are African or who are BME, this is lacking. We have a push within the NHS workforce to have visibility for Africans or BME communities. But when we delve down into the community, we are not finding that same effort in terms of um, getting representatives within the community itself who relate to the community. And so this is a push again for our peer-to-peer -peer work where we are saying other peers in the community will understand their peers, and they are more likely to tell the truth about what's going on for them, to share the issues, and therefore we take these issues as part of the approach with peer-to-peer, -peer, take them from the very voice of the community and address them in the way they want to see the solutions, not from the point of view of how we want to see solutions. Though that's what I would like to say just about stigma, the whole aspect of how we are tackling stigma right from the bottom root, and we would like to see more of this being supported in our work. Thank you very much. Uh George Valiotis. Thank you. And uh, Alex, thank you for that question to start us off. I think it's the most important question because what I think is essential to think about in this environment is Scotland has everything we need to cure hepatitis C and to eliminate HIV. We have all the tools. Treatment works. We know that if you have HIV and you're on treatment, you will be uninfectious. Uh, we know that if you've got hep C and you're on treatment, that you can cure it. Um, we know that we have PrEP, which is a, uh, an oral daily treatment that you can give people that if they don't have HIV and they take it every day, they're unable to acquire HIV. We have uh, condoms, you might have heard of them. They still work really effectively as well. So we have everything we need to stop HIV and hepatitis C, but we're not getting there, and that's because of stigma. So I think it's important to begin the day by framing stigma as actually being our key challenge. I appreciate that in terms of monetary savings and et cetera that you want to look at, um, you need to look at maybe some technical things within the NHS, but unless stigma is your number one lens in looking at this work, we're not going to get to zero and we're not going to achieve anything further. We know that from people with HIV, once they access treatment at NHS, they have really good outcomes. Um, Overwhelmingly, they love their clinicians, they love going to clinic, well, they don't love it, but you know it works for them. Overwhelmingly, and yes, there's problems here and there, but overwhelmingly, these things are working. What gets in the way consistently of prevention efforts and what gets in the way consistently of uh, treatment progress is stigma. So, 
Thank you for starting <laughs> us with that. Um, and I mean, I could talk a lot more about this, and I wonder if the further <laughs> questions will help us really specify how we, can, how we can address stigma at every level of the response. Thank you very much, David. I, I totally agree that stigma is uh, a, a major issue. It, it's, it's, of course, it's not the, the only issue. Um, but I think we should try and place things in context as well and look at HIV separate from, from hepatitis C. Um, as far as HIV is concerned, we have um, getting on nearly 90% of the infected population actually diagnosed. We're just a bit short of the WHO target. We, we've done... Uh, Scotland has done extraordinarily well in relationship to uh, HIV. I'm not saying there aren't challenges. There are challenges still to diagnose that uh, 10 to 15% to of individuals who uh, remain undiagnosed. But um, over the, the last um, three decades, Scotland on the HIV front, I think, has done um, it has done extremely well, and in relationship to injecting drug use, and we know there's a, a small outbreak of HIV among injectors in Glasgow, um, harm reduction services uh, for injectors um, uh, in Scotland have been absolutely outstanding, and uh, the prevention, general prevention of HIV among injectors uh, over the last uh, three, three decades has been uh, one of the great uh, public health uh, achievements, uh, really of all time, I think. It's been a, 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 a phenomenal achievement and saved the country uh, in terms of human cost and, uh, and economic uh, cost. Uh, it's incalculable. Uh, so I think we've got to uh, place that uh, in context. I think we've also got to uh, except that uh, in terms of uh, HIV and uh, MSM, a lot now is being done on the uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis front. A lot of uh, work, new work is being done to try and uh, reduce transmissions there. Uh, and so while there are challenges on the HIV front, uh, I think we have to recognise uh, that the country and uh, um, uh, health services, government, have, have done an awful lot more to be done, though. I accept that. On HCV, different ball game to really. Um, the action plan came in in, 90, in, in, in 2008. We had uh, uh, 38,000 people infected in the country. Um, uh, it's 10 years on. Um, we now have 34,000 people uh, infected, so the prevalence has come down. Um, it would have been much higher than the 38,000 had it not been for the action plan, but huge challenge there. 38% of the infected population had been diagnosed in 2008. Now it's nearly 60%. So in relationship to trying to get in contact with those individuals, I think a really good job has been done, but a massive job still to be done. And I think as John sort of pointed out, um, still a lot of people out there diagnosed, really thousands and thousands have been diagnosed who are not actually in services, who are not engaged, who are not able to take advantage of the new therapies. And I think the critical thing is, yes, it's about making services bespoke for this population group. Very vulnerable group, very chaotic group, must make the service bespoke. Tayside has done that extremely well, and I'd like to see that rolled out uh, to the rest of Scotland. There are some islands of excellence and uh, good practice, outstanding practice in other health boards, but it's not enough. We actually have to tailor our services, make them user-friendly, get out there, not expect these guys to come to us uh, in hospitals, get out there into the community settings, make sure they're diagnosed, make sure they're treated, uh, and that way I think we will essentially handle the problem. So yes, it is partly to do with stigma, but there are other factors that come into play. Thank you very much. And I think Duncan McCormick also wanted to. Thanks. Actually, I think David said a lot of my points, which I was going to relate to, but again, that's all right. Um, again, I think stigma is very important, but people we're talking about maybe have HIV, they maybe have hepatitis C, but frequently they're also drug injectors, they're sex workers, they're homeless, they um, are poor. Um, they're excluded from society in many different ways. So um, the infection itself is not the only barrier they have to accessing and, and benefiting from services. And we have in Lothian, we did a, a review of, um, of people referred for hepatitis C treatment and how they dropped out along the pathway, which has been done nationally as well. And the dropout rate is really high. It's about 70% dropout from the first appointment. And that's not just because of stigma, it's because of all these other um, 
factors in their lives which make it very complicated. So I think that's something to, to bear in mind. The other thing is, I think, again, although stigma is an issue why people don't access services, a lot of people do access services. And um, people access services for getting injecting equipment, they access services to see their GP, they access services for um, addictions treatment and for sexual health treatment and lots of other things. And these are opportunities where they could be tested. And I don't, I th again, think it's stigma which is stopping them not being tested. I think it's a lot to do with little barriers, like it's not routine practice. A lot of staff are very busy, particularly in the addiction services. You know, there was a few cuts there. They feel they don't have time. Um, third sector staff don't always have access to information to know whether or not the patient needs the test because they can't access NHS records and things. So <clears throat> there is the issue of getting people in. There's also the issue of when they are in, taking advantage of that opportunity and testing them. And just for Petra, I think you'll be pleased to know we are looking in Lothian at starting to do hepatitis C testing in pregnant women because it's very cheap to do. Just add it onto the PCR test and we're going to see what the yield will be there. Okay, I'm conscious that the, this is such a general question that we could have a debate ar around it for the entire session. Um, I don't want to do that, so I'll... I'll I'll call Ken, who's not spoken, and then we'll ask, I'll ask Alison Johnson to ask a second question, which I suspect will allow some of the folk who want to come back uh, to comment further. Ken. Thank you. Just, just a, a comment, I guess, about stigma in rural areas of the country, where I think it really is a, still a significant issue. You're, you're more well-known. It's difficult to hide for people. Um, and one of the things that we found is a benefit in these parts of the country is to work closely with the third sector. Um, we, you know, we, we partner with Waverly Care in Highland. There are other third sector organisations as well, but uh, they do an excellent job, and people are more likely to be, approach them, uh, discuss them with them their their conditions, than go to the statutory agencies like the NHS or the local authority. Okay, thanks very much, Alison, and followed by Jenny. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. Can I address a specific question to Professor Dillon in the first instance? I'd just like to understand why the NHS Tayside using prevention as treatment model is so important. So from a hepatitis C point of view, it is still transmitted by injecting drug use. So even with the availability of opiate substitution therapy with needle and syringe provision, which has largely removed HIV from uh, the people who inject drugs population, that it still allows transmission to occur with hepatitis C. So in your career as an injecting drug user, perhaps you inject for two, four, five, six <coughs> years before moving on to recovery. <clears throat> if you become infected with that virus during that time, you will potentially interact with six or seven other people who you will pass the virus on to before your career um, changes and you move away from drug use, if you do. There the clears a lot of variability. If you can offer treatment at a very early stage while people are still actively injecting who are infected, you then reduce, when they have contact with other drug users and share equipment with other drug users, their chances of transmission disappear because they're not infected anymore. So that's the idea of treatment as prevention. So it hasn't, it's, clearly we've got the idea of PrEP where you can use it before a sexual act to reduce your chances, but this is actually targeting the people who are infected and therefore not allowing them to contact or to infect other people within it. The impact of that is that rather than waiting as is standard practice at the moment to when people are stable, where they've moved on to opiate substitution therapy or moved into recovery, and we then treat them there, where traditionally that's perceived as being an easy population to treat because they're stable and have moved away from the, the chaos in their earlier lives, it means the bucket is constantly being refilled, that new infections are replacing those that you've treated, which is in part why all of the treatment activity has had, that we've done in hepatitis C has had a, a smaller effect on um, hepatitis C prevalence than would have been done if we could cut down the incidence. So in Tayside, we are trialling a model where we will um, dramatically increase the number of people with, who are actively injecting drugs who have hep C that we will treat, and we'll bring the prevalence in that population down from about 30-odd percent down below 10 percent, which means transmission will fall from 5 to 10 percent down below 1 percent, and that would lead to the extinction of the virus. And we think we can achieve that over two or three years. If you can take the new transmissions of the virus out, then all of your subsequent treatment can be used to treat those pe older people who are stable in the community, and you can then move to a situation where hepatitis C is eliminated in Tayside, potentially in four years' time. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. I think Dr. Crichton wanted to add a little comment on that. Um, 
This side is not the only uh, board in Scotland. Probably all Scotland would like to use the model. And certainly in Glasgow, when we were faced with the HIV outbreak, we wanted and we still wish to use treatment as a way of preventing the further spread of HIV among the drug injecting population. So it remains a desirable um, way of tackling the outbreak. However, the addiction gets in the way of individuals engaging with the with the service and the treatment itself. And that's why we have put forward additional um, uh, ways we wish to tackle the issue that we will discuss later so that I don't stay into other. Thank, th thank you very much. A, a supplementary on that point, I think, from Ivan McKee. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thanks, mm -hmm. convener. Um, <coughs> it was really just to follow up on um, the, the specifics of what we're talking about here in the, the, the treatment as prevention and the elimination potential of um, of Hep C, um, and, and I can see how that model works, and, and I believe you can confirm I'm wrong. But I mean, the, the data around that is pretty solid. If you do what you say you're going to do, the effect will be that that will be eliminated within that time frame, and that's obviously something that would be applicable across across the whole country. To what extent does the, um, the the funding mechanisms for treatment cause problems? Because clearly, this is classic prevention. What you're saying is, if we spend a bit more now, we'll save a fortune in future decades because we won't have to treat the problem. Um, how much of a barrier is there there in understanding that and directing the resources to the right place and putting the right amount of resources in up front to make that happen? And how easy is it for the government to fix that? Um, it's clearly a barrier. Um, all the health boards are um, have difficulty with cash flow. NHS Tayside has a particularly acute problem that I'm sure many of you are aware of. Um, we have managed to persuade the health board that this is the benefit in terms of financial of health gain dominates the short-term costs. Clearly, it is cost-saving over a five or a ten-year horizon, um, but it does mean investing more money now in this year. As the drug costs have fallen, we're not talking about increasing the overall drug spend. We're talking about maintaining it. So if you look back two or three years to how much we were spending on hepatitis C when the new active drugs became available, the cost of those drugs has fallen substantially. And so what we're talking about is still actually reducing that budget, but being able to treat within that envelope. So the money was there, but clearly there are pressures around it all. So that's the sort of argument. And being able to make the argument to the finance director Give me this money for three years, and I will hand back my drug budget and will not ask you for any more. There is no clinician that can go to a finance director other than those that are treating hepatitis C and be able to say mm. that. Are you able to put some numbers on that? I mean, specifically, how much are we spending per year at the moment, and how much would you need to spend at the moment to deliver what you need to do? So for NHS, I can give you sure. for NHS Tayside. Yeah. I don't have the figures for all of Scotland. We spent three years ago. We spent approximately four million in the first year that the new DAAs were available. This year, we're likely to spend two point two million, and over the next three years, to deliver this elimination agenda, we're going. We plan on spending two point one million. Sorry, so the recurring cost per year, if you do nothing, is how much? So we would carry on treating people that were coming through treat through for treatment anyway, and that's in the order of one and a half to two million anyway. So it's a small additional cost. So in terms of numbers of patients you need to treat for the treatment as prevention in NHS Tayside, given our deprivation index and given our uh, prevalent use of uh, intravenous drugs, is about 350 to 400 people. So that's the additional number right. of people you need Sorry, to... Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not getting... The question is, if you, before you started this, how much were you spending per year and how much extra do you need to spend to eliminate and then how much do you save? So I've given you the total yeah. figure, so it was 4 million down so to So you were spending 4 million per year before you started doing it. And how much extra did you need to spend to eliminate? So we haven't eliminated yet. But so to, we're in to, process. to do that, so, you, you know the numbers. How yeah. much? So, so in terms of going forward to deliver both the treatment of people who have Hep C and are advancing, have advancing disease and therefore needing treatment, and the addition of going in and treating active drug users, we're delivering that within two point one million pounds. Okay. Thanks very much. Well, wow. perhaps. perhaps. Yes. Wow. Well. <laughs> Perhaps I think David Goldberg may and want just, to, just to uh, try and build on, 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 on what John's been saying. Um, I asked, well, HPS estimates that are probably about 4,000, 4, 000, 4 to 5,000 active uh, individuals who inject drugs uh, in Scotland who are chronically infected with hepatitis C. Okay, between four and 5,000. So, these are the people who have the potential to transmit to, uh, to others. 
Outside of that group, by the way, the potential to, tr to transmit is incredibly low, okay? It does happen, but it's incredibly low. Probably about 98 to 99% of all transmissions of HCV in Scotland at the moment relate to injecting drug use, okay? Um, so we're got, talking about four to 5,000, and then the cost of treatment is, what, 7,000 to 8,000? Uh, um, uh, it's in that sort of ballpark, and you can do the mathematics there, so you're talking about... Uh, if you were to actually go for that group, uh, you're talking about drug treatment costs of getting on for about 30 million. Uh, but then, of course, there are all the other costs of um, actually managing the whole thing, coordination, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, um, and not an easy job, but the concept of treatment to prevent on onward transmission is a really good one. It's a really good concept. It's intuitive. I have absolutely no doubts it will help matters. It will reduce onward transmission. I think the big question is to what extent and for how long? And that's why we're doing this research in Tayside to actually examine this, because we don't have actually all the answers here. It is possible that the, the actual sort of outcome will be different to what we thought. Maybe better, maybe a little worse. We don't, we don't, we're not sure. But we do believe in the, uh, the concept. Intuitively, it's right. And it's right for, I think, uh, for HIV as well. Treatment of infection for the individual is good, but is also good for the population if that individual has the potential to spread it to uh, other people. OK, I think that opens a wider question as well around cost-benefit analysis. Uh, Ash Denimac. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, it's mainly, it's following on from um, Ivan McKee's question about this issue of cost-benefit analysis. So I'll just pull out a couple of comments from some of the written submissions that we received. So John Dillon, you said in yours, there's limited health economic input available and that the power of such analysis isn't available really to be utilised for this purpose. And David Goldberg, you said that it would be helpful if the framework could call upon a health economist. So that's the question really. Is there a, should there be a health economist? Would this enable boards to make better decisions? Personally, um, I, think, I think so. I think there's no question that the, all, all our activities, um, um, uh, policy, practice, has been um, underpinned by good monitoring systems. We do actually have really good monitoring systems in the country. So we've got good data, and we can tell you how many people are infected and how many... Um, individuals have been prevented from going on to liver disease or HIV disease and, and all that kind of thing. So we, we, we actually um, have really sound data. What we haven't got is precision in relationship to the cost effectiveness of interventions. I mean, there's stuff in the literature, I accept that, been done in other countries, but I do think that Scotland would benefit from actually a little bit more precision in this area with health economic uh, support uh, working with us. I mean, I've, I've no doubt that most of our, our, our interventions um, will be uh, pretty cost effective, but it's ability to be able to demonstrate that, yeah. that we haven't actually done as well uh, as we might have. When you're, when you're bidding to an individual health board to make a decision, there is models from the literature about the health economics that you can sort of manipulate. Uh, if we did this in this in our territory, we think this is what would happen. But it's not as convincing as having someone who has personalised the models and the projection or actually done the analysis on the data. And um, as a clinician appearing in front of a health board saying stuff, I suspect it's assumed that I'm being economical with the truth before, before I start and that I'm gilding the lily somewhat. And so having some personalised specific analysis would strengthen the cases that we're trying to make rather than um, me extrapolating data that many of the people around the board don't particularly understand and then trying to apply it to a particular territory or a particular intervention. <coughs> Dr. Crane. Any drug before it's allowed to be taken up by NHS Scotland goes through the uh, Scottish Medicine Consortiums, and there is both clinical and uh, cost effectiveness that has to be made for the committee to allow, <coughs> excuse me, to to allow the drug to be used. So, past that, there is no requirement for NHS boards to carry out additional 
um, economics analysis because that is done upfront to allow us to use it. When we move on into novel ways or public health uh, analysis, we do sometimes make uh, resort to health economists, um, particularly when assessing the new interventions and we go to the boards, but probably not all boards have access to health economists as there are, there are many of them. Um, and there's another issue of actually tracking the impact of our interventions. And that goes into the evaluation and economic evaluation of impact of our actions. So it's, it's a complex thing we could do better. There is some already in place that is uploaded, so upfront. And boards have to be pragmatic in how we, how we carry out business so that we maintain our, um, our financial envelope so just as a follow-up to that, then what would be preventing Health Protection Scotland from carrying out this type of health economics? Is that a role that they should be playing? Um, well, I think in the framework, um, 2015 to 2012, well, the framework started in 2011, and uh, in there um, essentially um, has its outcomes, and then it's basically saying, right, okay, we're going to monitor our performance against those outcomes, and we have these outcome indicators. Uh, and there's a uh, now uh, there's a data portal, uh, and you can access that data. since December. The public can access that data portal and see how people, how how boards are are doing in this respect. But I think that if we were moving forward, 2020 to 2025 or whatever, then it would be helpful to have in there not just outcome indicators, but perhaps more on uh, cost effectiveness um, of, um, of interventions, particularly on the preventative sort of uh, area, but uh, particularly on the behavioral front. The more complex sort of interventions, I totally accept the drugs uh, in terms for treatment purposes, uh, I have to go through a, a, a rigorous uh, sort of process. But I think if there was something in there, in the framework, which is basically saying we don't just want to, to know about uh, the performance in relationship to um, changes in prevalence and incidence and all that, we want to actually know also about the, uh, um, the effectiveness and the cost effectiveness uh, of... Uh, uh, our spend uh, in relationship to interventions. Okay, I'll take George Aliotis and then I'll move on to uh, Jenny Gluruth and questions around education. You are, I echo the comments of my peers, but I also want to add an example of good practice. Uh, HIV Scotland administered the PrEP Short Life Working Group uh, last year or the year before. And what we did in that instance was we used the international literature to where there was good evidence about cost effectiveness of PrEP in Scotland. So that work had already been done in the literature. We then um, assembled an expert group that included clinical expertise, people from the Scottish Medicines Consortium um, and academia. And we did a cost implications exercise because we obviously couldn't do cost effectiveness. And then that report that we generated was used by the SMC when they did their assessment. And so all told, that created a portfolio of cost effectiveness. Um, we were able to ascertain, we were able to approximate how many people we thought would benefit from PrEP and et cetera. So we thought that was a pretty good model. In terms of going forward and seeing further cost implications, we obviously can't, we'll have limitations in how we measure that. But also, we know it works, we know it's cost effective, and that model worked for us. So just as an example of how we've been operating so far. Okay, thanks very much. Jenny Gluruth. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, I'd like to ask quite a specific question to HIV Scotland and to Waverly Care, because you both flagged up in your submission uh, inequalities in terms of educational provision of sex education. Um, so HIV Scotland, you, you flag up that two young people between the ages of 15 and 24 are diagnosed with HIV each month, which I find quite shocking. And you're asking the government for specific legislation on this, on relationships, sexual health and parenthood, um, because you say you want it to be a compulsory component of the curriculum to guarantee equality of access. And again, Waverly Care also highlight a varying delivery and quality of sexual health education. So I did my homework last night and went through the curriculum content for the health and wellbeing curriculum area. And there are three pages of content in that curriculum guidance already on uh, dedicated to RSHP from early years right through to fourth level. So are you therefore aware of areas in which it is not being taught at the moment? And do you have evidence of that? Yes, absolutely. We are aware of areas it's not being taught. We're currently conducting um, research 
um, where we've heard so far from 2,000 young people who are telling us about their experiences of, um, of learning. We know that I don't have the actual figures yet because that research is, is currently ongo ongoing, but there are gaps, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. It's not essential for schools to be teaching um, these subjects. Yeah. It's very easy for a child to be sick that day and have missed that. Um, so yeah, like absolutely, we have uh, clear evidence that that's, that's not going on. It depends on which school you, you go to. Uh, it depends on the choices of your parents and your, and your school. So yeah, there's an, an absolute gap there. And we know that because we see two young people a month being diagnosed, that in order for kids to get access to their health, to be able to keep themselves protected, we as adults have to make choices that are in their best interest. And this evidence is telling us that they're not getting the information that they need to keep themselves safe. So mm -hmm. that's why for us it's a priority issue, absolutely. And uh, I think in terms of Waverly Care, recognising that very aspect that kids are not getting the sexual health education that they need to, part of our, in, uh, for our project called the WAVE project, which is in the Highlands at the moment, that's a project that's funded to actually fill that gap to actually be the people that actively go into schools and teach this because as uh, George rightly says, teachers are not you know, obliged to teach this. They have it, but there's no assurance that they are going to do it. But if there are projects like ours who can go in and do this and offer to do this for schools, schools are, are, are opening up for us to come and do that. And I think that's where we are also calling upon consistency with all the NHS boards where there are good models that are working it's, uh, we are encouraging, you know, NHS both to take this on. Right now we are in the, in the highlands, but it could be a model that could be rolled across so that it's not just dependent on schools, but projects like ours can also deliver this. Just, yeah. just on that specific point then, you highlight in your submission and the shared resource, which I'd, I'd never heard of before, so I had a little look at that as well, which was developed between yourselves and Education Scotland. Is that correct, Mildred? Yes, it's yeah. used, that's what um, it is. Yeah. But obviously a teaching resource, again, is not compulsory, much mm -hmm. like your experiences and outcomes. So is there specific course content which is in that share resource, and I don't know if you can comment on this, which is not currently in the curriculum content at the moment in health and wellbeing? Is there something missing there in the curriculum content that you think that the share resource offers? I think what I can just comment on is the resource that we have at the moment. So the yeah. resource that we have at the moment is very interactive. Mm -hmm. So it's different from expecting a teacher to just deliver on a content and tick a box. This yeah. is about interacting with the children themselves, letting them have the discussions, ask questions in a peer environment to a non-threatening individual who's just in the school and out. So I would just say the resource that we have at the moment works better for, for students rather than them listening to a teacher who they see in the corridors, you know, week in, week out. This is a group of people that come in, they are, yeah. they are you know, they are separate from the school, so they are able to solicit questions from students that maybe teachers would not be able to, to get from their students. And do you recognise yeah. that as a strength, therefore? So, yeah. for example, in my experience, um, perhaps you teach the child English and you then also have to go and teach them sex education. Uh, do you think it's a strength then having an outside agency coming in and delivering that? From your experience? Oh, always, absolutely. Yeah. I think, though, Jenny, there are things missing from the shared curriculum. Like, because yeah. HIV has changed. Like, we know a lot more about treatment as prevention. We also know about PrEP now. Mm -hmm. So it's time that that was updated. And I believe there is some work undergoing to update that. So that has to be done. Yeah. But most importantly, we can't be everywhere as a third sector. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to involve us where you can, but actually we need to see some statutory changes here so that every child, no matter where she's living, can get yeah. the same quality of access, no matter where she is. Mm -hmm. Just a, a last wee question on this point. Um, it's actually to David Goldberg with regard to that data gap that we seem to have. Um, it says that the last kind of data that we have around about young people's experiences of sex education was done in 2012 um, with regard to outcome one of the sexual health framework. Uh, Maury conducted a survey. No other data is currently available through HPS. Why is that the case? And are there plans to do some sort of more data here's gathering? My, here's, here's my opportunity. Thank you for asking that, that question. Um, um, out of scope, for HPS, Health Protection Scotland is infectious diseases and environmental incidents and doesn't cover the sexual health territory, which is, in fact, um, non-infection uh, uh, non sort of related. The organisation that did uh, cover that uh, was Health Scotland. Um, and it actually had, it was fairly active uh, in this area uh, over sort of many years. Um, it doesn't cover this area specifically anymore. Okay, so they'll have, it might cover it a little bit in the area of inequalities, but it doesn't have a, I think, a national visible sort of presence in uh, sexual health. And indeed, there is no national agency 
in Scotland that um, covers this particular area. Uh, and I think... And what change was, are you aware? Um, I, I, I don't know the reason okay. for, for, for that change. I mean, even I think when, I think, I think, I don't want to say any more about Health Scotland in that respect because yeah. I, I don't have all the facts mm -hmm. uh, available to me. What I do know is that there is a gap in terms of leadership, coordination, uh, data at a national level. I'm yeah. not talking about local. I think there are boards which do a, a hell of a good job uh, in this respect. But from a national perspective, this is a major gap. I've brought this matter up, by the way, it's not the first time, to the executive leads of the uh, sexual health and bloodborne virus uh, framework. Mm -hmm. So they do sort of know about it, but it's good to be able to air this uh, within this uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, forum. It is a problem. And so for the territory of um, uh, sexual health and relationships, education, and yep. uh, all this. Uh, yes, we can. Uh, you know, I think third sector HIV Scotland has done a tremendous sort of job here, and other third sector organisations as well. But we don't actually have a national statutory uh, organisation that is leading this area. Do you have a view with regard to who that should be? Should it be the job of Education Scotland, for example, to go into schools and survey pupils about their experiences? I don't know. In terms, the, the operational sort of side is one thing. I yeah. think there's a strategic sort of uh, um, side which is um, missing here, and that's the thing that I'm really sort of uh, okay. uh, focusing in on. I've got a supplementary question from Alison Johnson, and then mm -hmm. I know Duncan McCormick and Amelia Crichton both have comments to make on uh, this wider discussion. Alison. Yeah, I'd just be grateful to. Um, uh, witnesses, if you could just advise whether uh, I'm hosting an event in Parliament tonight um, for the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health. It's really sort of looking at the state of child health in Scotland. And one of the, their recommendations is introducing statutory sex and relationships education in all schools. And I just wonder if that is something that everyone here would support. Is there, uh, you know, is uh, maybe it might be quicker to ask if anyone doesn't support that. I think that's a fairly, a, fairly, a fairly loud response of uh, yeah, uh, can, no indication. Can I just ask very quickly, convener, um, uh, Miles Briggs and I, as part of our health committee work, recently visited a drug partnership in Edinburgh, and we heard from a, a group of people who are now in their 30s, all, um, well, it was some in recovery, some aiming to be so. And, uh, you know, they said that they'd been, uh, some of them had been introduced to heroin, for example, by family and or friends as, as young as 13. Um, and they were absolutely determined that we need to get better about introducing people to this subject uh, far earlier than we do. And the hepatitis C trust event that was in Parliament, I think that was last week, there was a, oh, you were there Petra, you know, we heard again that there has to be more information reaching people who can make decisions before family and friends perhaps approach them. I was just wondering what it is we're doing that's you know, what, what, what are we missing here? Because it, it just seems very frustrating. I'm going to take uh, Duncan with his Lothian hat as well. Um, clearly a relevance, Amelia, and then I know there's a supplementary from Alec. It's just on the share training, I agree completely. We need to have people coming in, but also having teachers who are trained because the young people aren't, they have questions all the time. They have to have someone there they can go and speak to, who then may go and access more expert advice, but they need to have someone there all the time. The other thing, I don't know if it's happening in other health board, I think not everywhere, but in Lothian at least, there's a decrease in uptake of condoms in young people. And so I'm not sure how this would all work, but guess access to condoms without any hassle, um, maybe in school settings or elsewhere, is another issue to think about because it's definitely a problem in, in Lothian. And we're just thinking about having access online because people don't like the paperwork and all the traditional ways of, of getting condoms. Thank you very much. First and foremost, we need to highlight the successes in sexual health in the last 20 years. So how much what happens now, it's, a, it's the consequence of the previous successes. Health Scotland now um, has revised their strategy. Indeed, they decided to move on into the inequalities as opposed to covering all the health education topics. So the sexual health, it's now... Part of the curriculum, as uh, Jenny has said, that means everybody does a variation of what they, they see fit. 
So there's also additional top-up training and the, the Sexual Health Health Improvement Network in Glasgow is the one that actually provides additional training for schools. But again, it's not a compulsory we're going and see every school. It's, it's again a, a matter of relationship and who asks and where we see the need. The other major success has been the reduction in teenage pregnancy. So we use that as an indicator of what happens uh, in sexual health, but it's not, we're not there yet. We still have a lot to do. A major concern right now with the sexual health services being passed on to the AJB, um, in Glasgow in particular, we see a, a, a revision of the provision and we're going to have more cuts and money taken out of the service. Therefore, we are concerned about what is going to be available in the future because unless you have a major crisis, there's no issues. So we need to put in the curriculum, but we need to ensure that we monitor and have additional ways of engaging people because I comple completely agree with Mildred. S uh, teaching out of the usual curriculum is really valuable for individuals, particularly those at risk. And to pick on Alison's point, you know, being introduced at the age of 13 or well, a teenager to drugs, alcohol, and so on, what can we do? The only evidence we have from the world is what the Icelandics have done and that was actually getting the families to spend time together, empowering the young people to actually look at alternatives to actually being out hanging on the street and drinking and smoking and doing other things. So it's having sports, cultural activities, spending time with, time with your family, and it's a whole person approach that actually um, works and is the only, the only thing that works. Thank you very much. Brief supplementary from Alex. It's more of a reflection, but perhaps other panel members would like to come in on it. It's about, in respect of uh, bringing um, sexual health and education in schools in, under a more statutory footing, um, we covered this to a certain degree in our Equalities and Human Rights Committee inquiry into school bullying, particularly around homophobia. And one of the things that came up, and, and I've experienced this in my personal life, my wife teaches in a Roman Catholic primary school, but I, I've spoken to many Roman Catholic teachers in the conduct of that inquiry, that whilst there is no uh, diktat or anything like that from within the Roman Catholic Church within schools, there is still an anxiety and a tension that exists for teachers within the Roman Catholic sector around this area because of the tension that exists between uh, what is normal, healthy education around these issues and church doctrine. Um, I think we need to be mindful of that and perhaps legislation in this way would give teachers cover within that context so that whilst there, there is no and I should stress this I don't want to cause a controversy there is no pressure within the church for teachers not to talk about this but there is a tension that exists because of the clash uh, that exists with church, church doctrine okay I don't know if any witnesses want to comment on that at this stage or it may be something to comment on in association with other uh, answers. Uh, Miles, did you want Thank to... Thank you, convener. I wanted uh, to um, pull together some of the discussion we've had around Hep C and specifically looking at um, those in treatment. So I think for 2016-17, mm -hmm. there's just over 1,500 new cases were diagnosed and 1,700 commenced treatments. Now, given that low level, what work is actually being done or what should be being done to try to um, extend that opportunity and looking at the government's target of elimination for 2030, we're no way going to meet that. So my question really relates to some of the evidence we've received with regards to identifying new um, patients and certainly the work which this committee did around prisoner health showed a real lack of opportunity there when um, mandatory testing not in place meant that many people weren't having any tests within prison and so therefore um, the opportunity to start on a treatment pathway was just not being realised. So I wondered from um, the panel today if they had any specific views on, on that. Let's comment on our prison work. Um, we've been uh, delivering a project uh, with the uh, people in prison, especially people who inject drugs, and uh, our service has really been a link service where we are actually hand-holding actually people from the prison setting when they are going into the community and continuing that support. I think what's been missing is that link where if someone is tested in prison, what happens to them? Let's say they've got a short stay, but also that's also changing also because of the shorter treatment um, um, cycle that's now in place. I, I just feel that a lot of the time um, when people are tested in prison, the follow-up is lacking. 
so people then get lost along the way. So our project, in a sense, in Waverly Care has helped to engage people throughout the treatment pathway. And I feel maybe this is something that also could be extended to other areas as well, so that there is that link in terms of treatment and care right from the start of the, right from diagnosis up to completion of treatment. I think this point also goes on, uh, touches on what uh, Tayside's pilot is doing around that whole hand holding through the process of treatment. Because sometimes it's about the attendance for appointments. If people, are accessing their treatment, it's okay. But we know we are dealing with chaotic, um, people with chaotic lifestyles. Waverly Care has found value in then hand-holding people through that process. And I think even when we're looking at the cost-benefit analysis, looking at that part aspect of actually hand-holding people in this pathway would also be helpful. So I think in, in response to that, looking at our prison work as an example, this is something I, I believe um, in terms of the work that probably is limited when you're looking at whether we test people or not, whether people opt in or opt out, the opportunity is there when we look at people who can handhold people through the process. So that's the comment that I would like to make. Uh, Petra, right. uh, yeah, I would just like to say that uh, testing uh, people using harm reduction services isn't compulsory either. Uh, it is something I would actually like um, to, to see. Uh, that everybody accessing harm reduction services got a, a blood-borne virus test. I don't really see why not. Um, I mean, that would take some of the stigma uh, as, as well uh, f for that population. But there needs to be more testing done in other areas as well. Um, like I say, as a pregnant woman, um, and in other sort of places, people are known with hep C to have rheumatoid arthritis, many other health conditions, thyroid problems, uh, that sort of thing. We, we need a list of um, conditions that people could present with, with hepatitis C, that could indicate that they needed to have a test along the lines of what happens for HIV. Uh, not only risk factors, but they look for other health things as well. Um, and I really think that it should be written into the service level agreement, say harm reduction services, that they aim to test 100% of all their service users and refer 100% of those positive directly into specialist services. Uh, historically, there were issues where the drug worker would test the person, deliver the test, and then decide that the person wasn't ready to be referred to hospital to engage. Um, so I'd like to see it being compulsory. Uh, David Goldberg and then Duncan Goldberg. So we estimate between 20 and 30,000 of the 34,000 infected, chronically infected people with hepatitis C are either undiagnosed or essentially lost to, uh, lost to follow-up, or maybe never, never in follow-up. Um, so there's a huge challenge. Um, government in 2015 did ask um, HPS to, to look at the cost effectiveness of birth cohort screening. This is, a, um, uh, this is something that the United States have um, uh, recommended, the Centers for Disease Control has recommended, and it's being implemented um, in part uh, across the United States. They've got a mixed problem, you know, I think part of their probably about half of their infection is, is um, healthcare associated um, and the other half is uh, injecting drug use associated. Um, we did look at this in association with Glasgow Caledonian University and we looked at it at a time when the cost of therapy was really very high. You know, it was um, certainly around about the £30,000 mark uh, per course of therapy and um, the, the cost, effective analysis, cost effectiveness analyses didn't look particularly promising, but things have changed very, very dramatically. We're down to uh, under the 10,000 mark. And um, it may well be now that there is a very, very compelling cost effectiveness case to be made for universal screening of a certain age group or a certain age band in primary care uh, settings, um, but possibly confined to uh, certain geographical areas, because we know that most of the hepatitis C in Scotland is located in 
uh, areas of uh, uh, of deprivation. And if that's a that's a, so that but there are challenges here. So if we come up with the cost effectiveness analysis, which says this is really going to be cost effective here, it's still there's still an investment. Uh, here, you still have to put money into that. You've got to actually work with general practitioners. Uh, you've got to invest in that sort of area. So it will be costly, but I suspect, um, and we'll produce the data very, uh, very soon, that it will come out highly cost effective as a consequence of treatment costs coming down. But the critical thing is that once you diagnose, once you diagnose, you've got to be able to offer that treatment there and then in the primary care setting. And one of our problems is that we have a limit. Uh, well, government, understand, has set minimum, uh, they're called minimum uh, treatment targets. Um, and uh, this, to a certain extent, has um, um, hindered our ability to go down that particular path and be innovative in these settings because once you diagnose, you want to be able to do the, re the next bit. And then, but at the moment, you've got to think, well, if we diagnose, we might not be able to do the next bit. Um, so the two things are linked uh, together. But if we were to uh, agree that uh, a universal sort of uh, um, United States type model, uh, I think we could make real inroads into hepatitis C. Thanks. I have Duncan McCormick and then John Dill. I'd to say, uh, in terms of opting out, opt out testing, I agree it's really the best approach to take. There's lots of challenges though, because people might choose to opt out. There's sort of people get discharged from prison very quickly before they've had an appointment to get the test. There are things we're doing in Lothian, which I think probably elsewhere people are doing as well, things like OraQuick, which are the rapid tests. So in police custody, for example, where people really do leave quickly, they can have a result pretty quickly and then they can go home with that knowledge and maybe get more motivation to link into services. Also, in terms of being out in the field testing people, we have a portable fibre scanner, which we have two now, which we're going to buy, and we have bought. And... Um, so that's as a sort of like to get people in for testing. If you get a fibre scan result, you can look at your liver and get your test. You're sort of starting to sort of get a bit more engagement with the whole process. Um, but I think it's a challenge to do that. Um, just the other thing in terms of cost benefit, and you mentioned it, um, was I think we need to do look at the whole wraparound service for people, not just the cost benefit of the drug pharmacological part of the treatment. It's also how to maintain stability, the primary prevention, the other areas of stigma and difficulties that people have, you know, sex work and homelessness and poverty and that kind of thing. So there's not much cost-benefit analysis of these kind of interventions at all anywhere, particularly with groups of people who happen to be a female drug-injecting sex worker who's homeless. So I think thinking about these kind of really vulnerable groups and cost-benefit analysis of things that work for them to keep them in treatment is really important. Thank you very much, John Dunn. So the clinical networks across Scotland and each health board who, are, who deliver the care have an individualised health board target based on the overall Scottish minimum number. With the financial constraints the health boards face, the minimum number is often, or the target treatment number has often become the minimum number plus one for that health board, which has led to a constraint. And David makes a valid point that if we're bringing patients, people into diagnosis and then saying, yes, you've got this nasty, transmissible, fatal disease, but we're not going to treat you, is exactly the wrong message to be, tell be telling them, particularly if they're vulnerable, particularly if we want to bring them and engage them in a wraparound holistic point of care, because we shouldn't be viewing hepatitis C treatment or HIV treatment in isolation. It should be encouraging uh, other healthcare behaviours in this group of patients and sort of drug-related deaths that many of you will be aware of. In our own work in Tayside, we've seen those people who have hep C and have engaged in care, their risk of drug-related death falls dramatically. And in fact, that's the biggest life-saving benefit in the short term, rather than prevention of death from liver disease. So that's important. We have had treatment pathways that have largely been set up based on interferon treatments, and then we've had the joy of these new, very effective drugs that are easy to give, and we have, if you like, cleared out all those people that were waiting. To rise to the challenge and the targets, the government has now committed in the last week to increase the treatment targets from 1,800 to 2,000 in the next year, 2,500 the year after, and 3,000 the year after that. That puts us back online to start to move to elimination by 3030. We would like to have had the 3,000 target now, 
but it is taking some health boards time to adapt their pathways because we do need to move out into much more integrated pathways of care where we can reach into people. There is a short life working group that's been brought together to try and highlight the best practices from across the world and in Scotland and come up with the toolkit for each health board to develop because there are differences between the different health boards in terms of where their distribution of patients is and how their services are organised and we need to be integrated into their services and equally we need to take away some of the medicalisation and the gear that went with hep C treatment when we just had interferon therapies because the field has changed. These drugs are very safe and literally it's sort of almost a treat and forget. Thank you very much. And I, I, before I bring Dr. Crichton back in again, I think Brian Whittle wanted to follow up the line of quest and again. Uh, thank you, Gira, and good morning to the panel. I think uh, from all the evidence, the, the, um, the link between HIV and sort of viral hepatitis and the drug community uh, is obviously um, very prevalent. So I'm, I'm wondering whether where the pressures are within that environment vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis, you know, uh, drug rehabilitation units, the work, work is there cross-referencing being done um, with, with uh, other agencies that are working within this environment? And, uh, and uh, is there a correlation between the pressures on their budget and, and the, the sort of rise, if you like, of the, say, HIV and, and, and hepatitis, and how do, how do you play uh, in between those agencies, and how does that, how does that correlate? John. So, as in the original action plan, we acknowledged the overlap, particularly with hepatitis C and the drug agencies and the drug treatment services, so it was a requirement that we had to have integrated treatment services so that uh, hepatitis C treatment services had to be available within addiction centres. That's worked well in some areas, less well in others. Clearly, the loss of budget associated with the ADP, uh, alcohol and drug partnerships uh, last year has put more pressure on the drug services, etc. So, when we're trying to take them, get them to be more holistic about the way they uh, work with their clients because if clearly if they've made a point of contact to move from injecting onto opiate substitution therapy or interacting with drug services to be able to offer them treatment around their hepatitis C uh, is, an, is an advantage. It means that client doesn't have to go elsewhere, doesn't have to face new barriers and new stigma. It can be delivered there. Equally, the treatment around drugs is often relatively confrontational around the addiction, but moving on to hepatitis C treatment is neutral ground, if you like, both the, the person infected with hepatitis C and the worker views them as a good thing to do and that helps build relationships and trust. So we need to convince our partners in drug services that there is a win-win situation for them here where if they're offering more services they'll get more buy-in to the whole treatment point of view. Where that's worked well it has been really successful and we've had huge uptakes and part of the success of NHS Tayside in having the highest diagnosis rates in Scotland and some of the highest treatment rates has been because of those integrations with drug partnerships and I think that's the way we should be going. I'll take Amelia Crichton and then Ken Oates. I must advise the panel that actually I'm the vice chair of the Glasgow ADP. And in that role, I've been leading on the work looking at the uh, addiction needs for individuals who are HIV positive part of the outbreak. That work has given me a lot of insights that I have never ever had before. What it became very clear is that there are a group of individuals that are shifting between prison, homelessness, are addicted to drugs, have experienced multiple trauma in their childhood, and it's very difficult to actually find a way to bring them into mainstream services and keep them there. What we have found is that they know that they are HIV, they know about HIV, they know that they are Hep C positive, they continue to share uh, equipment. Uh, drugs, needles, and they actually say, I, I know I'm hep C positive, so are you, and it makes no difference. The priority for them is the addiction, unfortunately, um, and as services, we have pulled together the homelessness, the addictions, uh, community justice in Glasgow. We're all working together, and we still haven't cracked it. We have Health Scotland on, on, with us. We have academia trying to create additional insights, but there are some difficult issues these individuals face and until we work with the users and understand their true needs it's very it's going to be very hard to actually deliver the services um, i must say that the budgets are an issue because we do have very very um, uh, aspirational and challenging uh, 
treatment numbers that the government wishes to for us to deliver in Glasgow. We are looking at actually finding massive savings as an NHS board. So we're looking at every single budget line that could be um, could be reduced. So we need to find a way of treating individuals who are most in need. We need to be mindful of the reinfection that we have seen already in individuals who have been treated for hep C. Um, and we need to live in the financial envelope and address the needs of the users. And these users are some of the most vulnerable people in the society. And the academic debate and the education means nothing to them. It's just we need to, to be where they are and take them with us. Thank you very much. Ken Oates. Thanks. Um, one of the key successes, I feel, of the, the Hep C program initially was the way it was funded. So it was ring fence funding. It was to deliver an action plan. It was easy for health boards except, and other partner agencies like um, Alcohol and Drugs Partnerships to utilise that money. There's been a drive in the last few years in the NHS to simplify funding so that it all gets lumped in together and something called the Outcomes Framework. So health boards are now allocated a massive sum of money to do a whole bunch of stuff instead of having ring-fenced programmes. And I know there's diverse views in this, but I think that that is very detrimental to the likes of these vulnerable people, vulnerable groups in society that had protected funding for streams of work before, like through alcohol and drug partnerships, harm reduction services, the so-called Cinderella services, because inevitably what happens with NHS when it's looking at global sums of money is it prioritises acute services, it prioritises waiting lists, where all the political and media focus is, and Cinderella services so-called lose out. And I would say that you know alcohol and drugs addiction <coughs> services, harm reduction services, the things that we're utilising to tackle these vulnerable uh, people and their problems um, are going to miss out and have missed out in the last two or three years because of that funding mechanism. And I would make a plea that, that we look again at that and see whether actually for these vulnerable types of people and for specific programmes of work on homelessness, etc., that we need to target funding at that within the NHS and council streams, not just give a global sum of money, because if we keep doing that, they'll never get funded. They're always the first to be cut. Thank you very much. I'm aware of time. I'd like to move on now and ask uh, Emma Harper to ask uh, her. Thank you, question. Convener. Um, the multi-agency approach is something that I'm interested in, and uh, the framework and update highlighted the importance of effective interagency working. And Dr. Amelia has already mentioned that just now, and Dr. Ken Oates talked about the third sector being really important in the Highlands. You know, I'm, I'm sure that the rural south of Scotland, it's really important to have third sector involved. So are the agencies working together um, appropriately, effectively, or... Is the health and social care integration process still at an early stage where we haven't got the buy-in from the IGBs or the engagement? So I'm interested in comments about that. Yes, thank you for my comment. I think, I think the agencies are working together as well as they can at the minute. We work a lot with the third sector, Waverley Care and CGL, Change Glue Live and various organisations. What's been a challenge though is data sharing. Um, so, for example, in, uh, we tried to do some work to look at homeless people who are drug injectors. The homeless database in the City of Edinburgh Council doesn't record risk factors like drug injecting, sex work, violence, this kind of thing. So it makes it very difficult to, to join services up. And also, third sector, I think potentially they could do, but they don't have access to some of the NHS data, such as last hepatitis C test. And that's a very simple thing. That if you can check that, you can then say, OK, you do another one. I'll give you it. If you can't get that information, it's more difficult. So I think data sharing, in my experience, has been a really big issue. Dr. Craig? Certainly, the Glasgow AJB has completely bought into it. There, there was massive commissioning in terms of third sector provision for, for individuals. And what they have done, they have pulled everything together. So there is now a head that actually is in charge of addiction, homelessness, mental health. So we're, we are trying to work together better. Data sharing indeed has been an issue. The Glasgow um, Needle Provision <coughs> Service has actually been carrying out uh, testing, but again, all that data sits in their nest. So we, we know if we look there what the situation is. We, look, we know if there's there what the situation is. 
right now uh, in NHS Scotland through the MRC we're going to carry out a big um, study that is going to link various data sets between the addiction services the homelessness the mental health so uh, the results won't be available until 2022 but it's really exciting because for the first time we're going to have a clear view of what actually are the needs and what's happening in this population but in the meanwhile what i can see is that there is there is direction right direction of travel by getting all together but we'll need the money to deliver and address what the users truly need because just us working together without taking the users is not going to get us anywhere Very much. so i'm assuming that you know which integrated joint boards are performing really well and the ones that might need a wee bit of help but that might be something to explore maybe like away from away from today in a separate type of engagement certainly an important question uh, david stewart yeah, thank you can i just reinforce the point about information sharing i think that's certainly a theme that came through uh, the evidence for example gps not being able to share with pharmacists um, or third sector groups but it was interesting in the evidence that the information uh, commissioner suggested there was more leeway than is often thought and also, I think it's important to know that there's obviously new um, in, uh, data protection regulations that are coming to force, which also affect um, our thought processes on this issue. I think that's right. I'd be interested in our comments. Yes, David Goldberg. I think from, that, from a national sort of level and looking back at sort of networks, national networks and, and leadership over <laughs> decades, actually, I mean, um, in this area, third sector been fantastic the integration there that from a national perspective absolutely amazing and hugely important um local authorities been really difficult i mean i can hardly remember anyone you know representing sort of local authorities at, the, at you know at a national level um being on our sort of committees and our networks and um Possibly not for the want of, um, it was maybe it was a it was a just a logistical sort of issue. Who would actually be the representative? There are so many local authorities, but believe you me, it has been a real struggle. And in the action plan, there was an action around local authorities to, to get local authorities embedded in there, and um, it was one of the few actions I think we failed on. Um, so I do think this is a problem. Of course, we've got the new Public Health Scotland um, agency um, over the, just over the horizon, and one of the, the things there is to try and make sure that uh, it's integrated. Um, but certainly my experience so far is that this has been a problem area. Are there other... Uh comments on, on, I think, these are important questions. Yes, Petra, right. It's just going to pick up on something David was saying there about the various networks and things in the framework, um, and also talking about the third sector. There was initially a third sector uh, network meeting that happened maybe four times a year. Now, there hasn't been one for three, four years. Um, so who's up there representing patients and their views? I've got no idea. And also the information doesn't come back from those who do represent us at these meetings back to the third sector. So uh, I just don't know the reason for that. OK, there's a, a, a question uh, that perhaps other witnesses might be in a position to assist with. Uh, David Goldberg. They, just to say that there are other national networks and, um, I mean, John chaired the Hepatitis Clinical uh, Leads Network uh, yesterday, had clinical leads from throughout Scotland, all the health boards, and in there was Hepatitis Scotland uh, um, representing the, the, the third sector. And the same applies... Uh, to other national networks with HIV Scotland uh, well uh, integrated. But Petra is right in that there was a network specifically for the third sector. And from my understanding, Petra, it was a very difficult one to, 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 to run. And it was to do with the dynamics uh, within, because 
I mean, it was. It was, it was, it was, it was um, I, 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 listen, <laughs> I don't. I don't know the. I don't know the full story. But if the third sector said to Health Protection Scotland, which runs the uh, all the networks in relationship to the framework, if it said, "Look, we want this third sector uh, back up and running," we will do that. There is absolutely no problem. But it's over to the third sector to actually push for that. It's just that nobody had actually communicated to me that it had stopped, even. Well, I think we can, I think we can claim an early achievement for this committee meeting, then, if we can see progress on that ask uh, moving forward. Uh, Duncan McCormick. It's just in terms of networks. I think the gap I've experienced in the last couple of years is really around opiate substitution therapy and harm reduction. And there is a, a prevention, non-sexual prevention part of this, the hepatitis C network, <coughs> that doesn't really link into the opiate substitution therapy part. The national organisation for that PADS, um, to me as somebody on the board, appears rather obscure and maybe a bit exclusive because I'm, I'm not clear the representation of all constituencies is there, such as third sector, um, you know, frontline workers, local authority and so on. So I feel that's a gap in terms of joint working for me at a board level. Uh, Dr. Crichton and then George Saliotis. The, the third sector is certainly represented on the ADPs, the ones that work well. Um, beyond that, I cannot comment. George. Um, on a policy level, because that's where HIV Scotland operates, we have various interactions with IJBs. The, the, the best example that we've had recently is with Glasgow looking at the closure of the Clean Needle program. And we had um, fantastic exchanges with the uh, local authority there in Glasgow. Um, but of course, this for me really points to the challenges that, that you have looking at the prevention agenda, because to get prevention right, you need to get treatment right, because it's almost the same thing for both hepatitis C and HIV. But when the focus is only prevention, that's where we've had challenges in engagement, because how does it seem relevant, perhaps, to local authorities who have many other things to do. I think, David, you pointed to the challenge that we have, which is representation is, is a real challenge because of so many people. So when there's a challenge, something specific that needs to be done, we have really good exchanges. But in general, when we're just looking for policy um, brainstorming, that's where we do have some challenges. I also just want to add something on confidentiality and information sharing. One of the main issues that people with HIV raise when they ring HIV Scotland with a concern is how the information is being dealt with. Um, and so we've, we've published guidelines on this, we've done a lot of work on this because it's a priority issue. And just as an example, we, we often get a call that might be someone saying, my GP has just found out that I have HIV, how can I get her to take that off of her database? So people's control of their information is at a whole new level of concern when it comes to HIV, and I think that's really important to keep in mind when looking at information sharing. Thank you very much. Any other comments on that? I think I think the, the, the whole general issue around uh, whether IGBs are helping or hindering, which um, Emma raised, I think we've, we've heard some answers to, but I think uh, also some useful suggestions about uh, renewing uh, some of the conduct that's there across sectors. Uh, David Stewart, I think you had one. Um, th thank you, uh, Convener. Could I just ask about future strategy for sexual health? Um, what do the panellists think about, can, are we adapting enough to changes in society, for example, social media, new psychiatric substance, or sexual health of older people? Is that already incorporated in a strategy, or do we need to adjust uh, for the future? Who would like to uh, take on a couple of, couple of important questions there about some of the issues that have arisen? recently and how uh, well prepared we are for dealing with those. Well, I, think, uh, initial, I think the, the, the Sexual Health and BBB programme is well set up and it empowers a lot of people within the boards and the ADPs to, to do what they think is necessary and so from my perspective in Lothian we've identified actually people, ageing people with HIV as an issue through the, one of the groups which actually is chaired by Waverly Care um, so it's got a good role for the third sector there. And we're doing some work to try and identify what those needs are and how we should change the services. So I think probably across all the boards, there is an opportunity to take on that work where you think it's necessary. Thank you very much. Uh, Amelia Crichton. In terms of mentioning social media, the, the Glasgow Sexual Health, Health Improvement have been using the social media for a long time. So um, they have targeted campaigns aimed at particular groups. 
more and more we are moving towards understanding which groups of society use different media. So the young people, we know that the only way to get in touch with them nowadays is use the appropriate uh, social media. But also um, there were a lot of successful campaigns aimed at men who have sex with men. There will be the group that actually has been the subject of debate this morning, and that's the um, socially excluded in multiple social issues that will be completely out with the social media or any other interactions. Um, so we need to be mindful of them. The older people, again, and the how we tackle the living longer, we need to be savvy about that because there's always a need to keep up to date and update our messages to the needs of individuals. But yes, we are considering um, all sections of the society, we need to prioritize our resources and adapt the communication to them. In terms of the wider drugs, um, Glasgow again through the ADP has uh, had a big event last summer looking at the um, issues around particularly new drugs that we're not called uh, psychotropes anymore because it's beyond psychotropes and thinking how the different things come together. So it's drugs, um, sex, alcohol, um, multiple risks, behaviors, and how we actually segment different, different individuals and bring a harm reduction approach to tackling with issues. Thanks very much. David Goldberg. Yeah. Um, I think it was Jenny, you pointed out that it was a report, um, it was in sex education, wasn't it, 2012? Yeah. 2012, and that was just a sort of one-off. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the data, the, the frameworks data portal, you find really strong data on infection, um, Hep C, HIV, the, the STIs, really, really strong data. So we know what's happening um, out there. And then when you actually get to, I mean, there are five outcomes. Um, so, um, one to three seem absolute are, are fine. F outcomes four and five, which are the sexual health uh, outcomes, um, there's just no infrastructure there uh, and what I mean by that no data um, uh, at a national sort of level which is I mean there may be data at a local level and I think there you know that some health boards have, uh, will have will have information but a, a co coordinated uh, approach to monitoring doesn't exist and also there is no um, um, coordination sort of infrastructure there's no uh, that um, uh, that can can deal with this, and that goes back to my point, that my earlier point about sort of uh, uh, the leadership sort of territory. I think this is something we really need to address. Okay, Th thank you very much. I'm looking around if, to see if I have any colleagues anxious to have one last question. Uh, but if not, uh, can I thank the witnesses very much? for your attendance this morning. It's been an extremely instructive uh, session. We will uh, consider it in some detail later on. And uh, uh, we'll, I will now briefly suspend the meeting to allow our witnesses to uh, leave.
at this meeting of the Health and Sport Committee. Our third item on the agenda today is consideration of petition PE 1611 in the name of Angela Hamilton on mental health in Scotland. Members will be aware that we considered this at uh, previous uh, uh, sessions and considered it as part of the work the committee undertook on mental health uh, and the previous work that the committee did included writing to Sir Harry Burns in his role as the chair of the review into targets and indicators uh, to make him aware of the petition and its request to reduce mental health waiting times uh, and uh, also of course we have heard from the Scottish Government on their mental health strategy. Members will have seen the uh, paper from the clerks which uh, invites us to consider whether to close the petition in light of the commitment made by the Scottish Government in its mental health strategy uh, to a change of approach to the devel and, and to the development of a system of indicators uh, for mental health provision. Uh, can I invite any comments from members and ask if that is uh, how you are minded to proceed? Alison. Um, yes. I I suppose, convener, I'm not entirely clear on whether or not the government's refreshed strategy and Sir Harry Burns' work have answered the petitioner. Um, Sir Harry Burns, well, it, it Burns, Sir Harry Burns' review simply said that waiting time targets should be subject to clinical prioritisation, um, and. You know, his review hasn't called for any change to, to those targets. No. And I'm not entirely clear that the government, the government is obviously increasing the level of investment. It's spoken about having 800 more workers. Um, and its commitments include a change of approach to the development of a system of indicators for mental health prioritisation. I'm not clear that that's going to impact on waiting times as yet. That's that's. That's my that concern to. about yep. closing it. I'm not entirely sure that it's being addressed elsewhere. Understood. Alex. Uh, thank you, Convener. No, I, I share Alison Johnson's concern about closing this prematurely. I think that uh, whilst uh, the rhetoric from government and indeed uh, tying in as it did with the review of targets by Sir Harry Burns is welcome, I, I think we need to keep a watching brief on this. I think the petition still stands. We are not reducing... Uh, mental health waiting times, if anything, they are going travelling north. Um, and I think, for example, in the budget, you know, I raised this at the last committee meeting, that £17 million is certainly welcome additional spend, um, but it's trying to do rather a lot uh, at the same time. It's going to pay for that initial investment towards that 800 members of staff. I reminded committee that 800 members of staff will cost you £20 million a year, um, and yet still also de deliver a, a quote-unquote transformation in child and adolescent mental health. I'm not entirely convinced that it will. Um, I hope to be proven wrong, but I, I would be very reluctant to close this petition until we see some tangible progress against these waiting times. Ryan Hood. Thank you, Commissioner. Just, just to add to Alistair Hamilton there, I think the direction of travel is very welcome. I think um, uh, all, all the rhetoric is very positive. Um, but I think before you can close the petition, you'd have to have some sort of indication of outcome. Uh, yeah, I think f f from my perspective, I would rather as has been said, I have, to have a, a, a bit more of a watching brief prior to, uh, so that we understand that the rest of travel is actually being adhered to and is actually having some sort of impact. So uh, I would be re reluctant to have it close at this point. Ash. I mean, the petition specifically makes reference to reducing the mental health waiting time target from 18 weeks to 14 weeks, um, you know, for adult therapies. You know, the government I would imagine are not going to do that. Therefore, should we keep? I just wonder whether, if that's not going to happen, if the government have responded saying what they are doing, which is to try and um, improve the outcomes, you know, that are existing already with regard to the targets we already have. Harry Burns has obviously suggested maintaining the targets as they are currently, not making any changes to them. Sure. Yeah. Jenny, yeah. 12 weeks for your, your child and adolescent mental health services. And as we know that five health boards, including Fife, are not meeting that 18-week target, are we not better to try and say, hang on a second, and to try and hold the government to account on the current numbers, which they are not meeting? So I think there's a judgment here about how we proceed, because clearly I think members have indicated that uh, the, what the responses on this area have been uh, broadly positive, but... Uh, not have not yet reached 
uh, the point of decision, but there is a there is a, a judgment on whether I think everyone would agree with the point that we want to keep the government's propositions on mental health treatment and treatment times under review. I think the only question is whether this petition, which is somewhat dated because of the developments since it was submitted, whether this is the right vehicle or whether we should close this petition and look forward to uh, finding other means for uh, maintaining that ongoing review in the months ahead. Alex. I, I think um, Jenny Gilruth makes a very good point about the fact that we're not achieving the 18-week target, so you know, let's focus on that, and that, that's a fair point to make. I think, though, that this petition represents a reflection of public expectation about where they would like to drive this agenda still further. They throw our metaphorical cap over the wall as it is. And I think we are we do well not to lose sight of that and be reminded of what um, the public would like to see in respect of these waiting times, irrespective of the fact that we're not even meeting the government set waiting times. I think that that's even all the more reason to, to hold on to this. Are there other views? I'd just like to, to point out a previous letter from the committee to the minister. Um, the committee said that we don't make a recommendation on a reduction to 12 weeks as we think the target needs a fundamental rethink. I'm not entirely sure that that's happened. However, um, we've also said as a committee we cannot see the justification for a continuation of different waiting time targets between mental and physical health conditions. Um, I'm, I suppose I'm reluctant to close it in case, you know, it's just seen as we, we accept the current situation. Yeah. The fact that we aren't meeting the current waiting times is, I'm sure it's of huge concern to everyone sitting around this table. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think any young person having to wait for the weeks they're being asked to currently is good enough. And clearly, I think most of us would agree that being seen within 12 weeks <laughs> is not exactly a, a speedy service. Um, so probably at the moment, I. I would be hesitant to close it. The, the issue, the issue I've got is... Ivan and then Emma. Um, the issue I've got is, obviously, if you're going to do this stuff, targets and indicators, you need to do it in a structured, coherent fashion. You kind of just go picking this one, picking that one, based on whatever petition comes in that day. And um, we've, we've kind of gone through that process, and maybe we need, that process has got more ways to run in terms of what targets and indicators should be there. But I think that's the forum to do that, rather than folk just finding random stuff. And we can have a hundred of these things on any old indicator, and we'd be sat here all, all day saying, should it be this, should it be that, should it be the other? Emma, followed by Brian. I mean, I'm aware that NHS of Reese and Galloway are 95% meeting their CAMS targets, so they're actually doing really well. So I think that there are people that need to perform better, there's people that are doing okay, and I am not sure that keeping a petition open like this is the way to proceed to hold the government to account. I think Ivan makes a point about um, about there could be lots of petitions looking at targets, but we're already being flagged about looking at targets and we're not meeting the targets already. So I'm not sure that this is the best way to proceed, but I still think we need to keep an eye out on a process for analysing the information. Brian, I think I think to 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 uh, to Ivan McKee's point. I mean, I think when you look at petition, uh, the the reducing of the target times is is one part of that petition, and it's it's probably the part that I'm um, least uh, in, 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 engage, engaged in, to be quite honest, because we're not hitting the original targets. But I think for me, it, it's it's more an understanding or getting some sort of feel that the direction of travel that. The response to the petition has had from the government and, and, and agencies um, is actually is actually becoming uh, is coming to fruition in that in that we're moving we're, we're moving in the right general direction. I think for for that reason, uh, particularly, um, I'm kind of hesitant to let it go. I just want to see that, that, that you know there's been a lot of really positive you know uh, uh, indications from the government and and, and welcome, um, but I would actually like to see some sort of movement. I think I hear I hear there are clearly different views around the table. I I, I, I guess the difficult or the question I would put back uh, to members is if we don't close this petition, uh, what what else do we need to do with it? Because it seems to me that this petition as a vehicle for raising uh, questions has been well used and has uh, kept uh, uh, allowed the committee to keep a focus on this issue for some 16 months. Uh, which I think is um, credit to the 
petition and the petitioner, but I wonder if there is anything further to be done with this petition, as opposed to further steps to uh, hold the government to account on, uh, on its um, uh, strategy and on the priorities that it's going to set in the period ahead. Alex. I think that poses a, wiser que uh, a wider question, convener, to the committee and to the wider parliament about the use and life of petitions. Um, the, the thing I'm struck by is, I think, a point that um, Alison Johnson made to say that um, to close it now almost either is an admission of defeat, that it is unachievable, or that we feel that we have done all that we believe possible to do in this area. Um, I don't think there's, I don't, I'm yet to hear an argument from around the table about the, what the negative consequence of keeping this petition open are. If we agree as a committee uh, to revisit it in a year's time, to benchmark progress against it, and if we're closer to achieving the aims of petition, then perhaps, you know, I would welcome the opportunity to close this petition as a sign that we were, as a nation, doing something tangible to close that gap that we're, the petition's about. We're not there yet. So I, I don't see the cost of keeping it open, um, and I think it's important to, to as a demonstration that, of will that we don't think this matter yet will or progress made. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think I think your point is a valid one in the sense that there is no negative consequence. I, I think the only negative is the sense that I have that this is a petition that was raised before the Burns review and before the strategy was published, and therefore I'm not sure it's the most useful basis on which the committee can have future consideration um, of mental health strategy. Um, but, uh, but of itself, keeping a petition open does no harm. But um, I, I, I think as time proceeds and as these things roll out, the petition will become less and less related to the circumstances that we currently have. Emma. As we continue to hear from the NHS boards about their performance directly, and I'm sure we'll have uh, Minister Maureen Watt in front of us in the future as well, so that she can directly answer about targets. I agree about the n there is no negative issue around keeping it open, but what is the best process then as we are assessing mental health, physical health, health and well-being? It's all part of what we've heard this morning. I think we're coming close to a, a, a consensus. Alison, did you have a last comment? Yeah, well, you know, here, here we have someone who's gone to the trouble to raise this with the Parliament, and I think I'm not entirely sure how the government has said that they'll develop new mental health indicators, um, but I can't see how developing that new system of indicators relates to any clear commitment to change yeah. these targets. Um, and, it, you know, Sir Harry Burns' review hasn't, it hasn't called for this. So I think it, I would like the committee to have more information on what the government do intend doing. You know, will these new indicators impact on these targets? At least then we'd be able to answer the petitioner more clearly instead of just closing it. And, I, I, and in, in, in light of, of what members have said, I would suggest that we do not close the petition today, um, but that we do await uh, developments uh, over the development of the indicators. I, I don't think there's any great advantage in getting ahead of ourselves on that, let's see what develops and what is produced, and then ask those questions, which I think we do have to ask. And in any case, Alex's suggestion that we use this as a benchmark to return to in January 2019, um, if we aren't satisfied that progress has been made uh, by then, seems a reasonable one uh, as, as, a, as a benchmarking exercise at that time. Miles. Can I just make a point on that? One of point three, um, with regards to a review, a progress review in 2022, I think um, that was something I was specifically concerned about, um, given the fact that, yes, it will be halfway through a 10-year strategy, but there is already issues being highlighted to MSPs about the government's current strategy. So I think um, that should form part of our discussion as well, whether or not we can um, see an earlier um, progress review to make sure we're maximising um, its effectiveness. OK, now that's helpful. I think, I think, I think if, if that's agreed around the table, then we'll proceed... Uh, on that basis, and uh, we'll, we'll, we will continue to keep a, a, a working eye on all of these matters. Thank you very much. Um, that concludes the public session of the committee, uh, so we will now move into private session.